Oh, hi there. Sorry, I was just reading my favourite manga, Adventure Time, next to the fire back here. After the awful year we've had, I feel like getting into the Christmas spirit early is a little bit more acceptable than normal. And so this year, me and my girlfriend made the poor decision to watch Dolly Parton's new Netflix Christmas movie in November. But first of all, I want to say thank you, Dolly, for helping fund the COVID-19 vaccine. You didn't have to, but you spent all of your earnings from playing Hannah Montana's godmother back in 2007 on helping us beat the <laughs> Shout out to Dolly Parton. Dolly, Dolly, your Christmas movie kind of sucked, but at least you're doing something good. Apparently she also saved a kid from getting hit by a car the other day too, so. Listen, I intended on making this video a little bit earlier in the year, and I was gonna talk about how maybe you shouldn't use this movie to get into the Christmas spirit a little bit earlier. I would probably suggest Elf, or the Santa Claus, or the Christmas Chronicles. They're on Netflix and they're pretty good. Or hell, even Batman Returns, which is a Christmas film, and I will die on that hill. But if you prefer a cheesy musical, that's somewhat confusing, but makes you feel like you're being cuddled by Jesus Christ the entire time, then Dolly Parton's Christmas on the Square is the one to watch. Hey, could you please slow down? I didn't even get a chance to hook my seatbelt. <laughs> Listen, I really don't want to have to hold your hand through the entire movie and explain it scene by scene, because not only is that not fair use, but let's be honest, after being the unexpected hero of the pandemic, I think the least we owe to Dolly Parton is to watch your Christmas film start to finish, even if that does make us contemplate what better things we could have been doing with those hour and 37 minutes. The movie starts with a town-wide song and dance. We find out that this postman is a gossipy dick. When you didn't hear it from me, but Mrs. Hampton forgot to put figs in her figgy pudding. No! And you'll later find out how batshit crazy this lady in the background is. Definitely should rough her up a little. There's some break dancing to keep the film hip to the youth. Maybe they can, can be doing a, doing a TikTok. You, you know, have you heard of TikTok? They could be doing one of the, the TikTok dances, right kids? There's some Christmas trees that somehow spring up on their own, and apparently everyone can sing and dance. How jolly. Dolly is also sparkling, and my first impression was, did they film this movie without her, and then just green screen her in later, you know, maybe because of Corona? But I was happy to find out that although she spends most of the movie sitting on a very realistic looking cloud, I was wrong. Hey! Hi! Hi. The main character in this movie is probably the antagonist, Regina Fuller. She's played by Christine Baranski, who's probably the most well-known actor in this entire movie, besides Dolly. Known for Mamma Mia, The Big Bang Theory, and the only role I care about, the camp counselor in the Addams Family Values. I actually made a video about the Addams Family recently, please watch it. As ham-fistedly explained here, Regina Fuller, I haven't seen you since your father's funeral six months ago. Her dad passed away six months before the events of the movie, and despite being like the Jeff Bezos of the entire town, <laughs> he was somehow loved by all the very unrealistic residents. Like, I know this is a happy Christmas musical, but I've never ever experienced a piece of media where everyone loves each other. Like, even the postman, who's just gossiping about everybody all the time, loves everyone. Legit, the only person in this movie that is disliked by anybody, it's Regina. And rightfully so, as she decides to ruin Christmas. What a dick. Okay, get this. After her father's passing, she inherits the entire town. In fact, the town is named after her. It, they literally live in a town called Fullerton. It, it's kind of like 12 year old me playing Minecraft and calling my town Brody Town. Which I'd like to point out, even I didn't do. Big headed much? She tries to ruin Christmas by selling the entire town. So the biggest mall in America can be built on top of it. Like this is so unbelievably selfish to just walk around the town at Christmas and hand eviction notices to all the residents and then fuck off again with what I'm assuming would be the net worth of Bill Gates. And she still won't give homeless Dolly Parton any change. But maybe it's because the change she wants isn't money. Are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? She also gives eviction notices to the little kids dancing in the street, which I thought was a little bit much. My girlfriend Lily described it pretty well by saying it feels like a school play. And with scenes like this, I couldn't agree more. What if I fail them? Worst of all, if the resistance doesn't stop her, I'll be failing you, my Christian, love. Christian, stop. Basically, despite the fact the entire town is being evicted at Christmas, these two care more about the fact that they can't conceive a baby. All you have ever wanted to be was a husband and a father. I didn't know that I would have so much trouble making that second dream come true for you. Oh, the wife feels so guilty that her husband can't be the father he always wanted to be. But it's okay, because we find out that maybe 
that's not what God had planned for them. Because maybe God didn't intend for that. I give God the praise, he saw fit to bless me with you. Yep, you'll probably realise now that God has a very, very large role in this movie. Now, I don't know if Christianity is still thriving in America, because here, I don't know many people who aren't either an atheist or just not religious. So I find it a little weird that this entire town simps so hard for God but we'll give you a pass, Dolly. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Considering it's a Christmas movie, I think the setup they had here for Regina to upset the entire town, despite them loving her dad so much, there's got to be some kind of redemption arc, right? Like, you can't just make a really miserable movie that's set at Christmas and be like, Happy Holidays! Ending it on the sad faces of the entire town as they leave their homes and businesses for capitalism. And that wouldn't have been very Christmassy of Dolly Parton. So of course she has to turn from this absolutely soulless woman into a saint that the rest of the town loves. And they tease us throughout the movie with a bit of compassion by showing a flashback of her dancing with the owner of the one and only shop that was closed while she was giving out the eviction notices. You no, I think she might have had a little soft spot for this guy. Mm, just maybe. Well, no. This movie isn't as simple as that. She catches him the next day instead. He sings a song about how she broke his heart and he misses her so. And she's like, lol, move on. People change. And then for the rest of the movie, he hates her just like the rest of the town do. You're not throwing this away, are you? Does it matter? It's all junk to you, right? <laughs> Damn, Dolly's keeping us on our toes already. So to make an unnecessarily long story short, Regina's only friend, the hairdresser whose singing voice is deeper than Corpse Husband, Christmas is the time for beauty, tries to change her mind by singing in her face whilst cutting her hair. Apparently she used to be the mayor of the entire town, but now she just cuts hair, kind of badly by the looks of it. Regina's like, lol, fuck you as she is to everyone in the movie, especially after going to the town meeting about the wickedest witch of the middle. The wicked witch of the middle, she steals our homes and bills. So I'm guessing Fullerton's in the middle of the country, like they compare her to the wickedest witch of the east and the west, but then of course concluding to her being the wickedest witch of the, the middle. Wickedest witch of the east? I thought you said wickedest witch of the west. Sorry. Not gonna lie, this song is actually kind of an earworm, but it's so weird because at the start, like, every line has this awkward gap at the end of it. They all just sort of wait for this line of music that they obviously can't hear to end. Maybe we'll burn her broom and crack her kettle. The middle. The griddle. The middle. It reminds me of those awkward videos where people have edited the laughs out of sitcoms. Pizza's on the way, I told you we wouldn't have to get up. What if we have to pee? I know it's a musical, but they can't hear that shit, so they're just sort of looking around in silence. <laughs> I'm also loving the fact that, that this super loving Christian town want to fuck this lady up. Especially this older lady. She's absolutely hellbent on beating the ever-living crap out of her. She says, Definitely should rough her up a little. With a face that says, I'm gonna bust her kneecaps in. I also feel really bad for this guy, because they basically cut all of his screen time just to show the pastor shaking his head, because I'm assuming from what we saw, he can't really lip sync. Maybe we'll just throw mud balls made of spittle. Oh no, oh geez. Regina then turns up and catches them singing about her, so she tells them, The new deadline to be out of your homes is now Christmas Eve. <laughs> <gasps> the Christmas Eve is tomorrow night! What a dick. She storms off and hits the pub. That's fucking lamp lighter. Oh god, she's so she's so nasty. She's so horrible. But before I go into detail and what happens in the next scene, I have another little bombshell to drop on you. Christmas movies are usually full of love, cheer, joy, and spirit. But not Dolly's Christmas on the square. Oh no. After a brief encounter with her high school boyfriend, Regina also has a brief encounter with the doctor who she's been ignoring for a few days, when she almost runs him over with her car. Oh. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> You're not gonna believe this. Turns out she shouldn't have been ignoring his messages because she might have a brain tumor. Oh. Oh my god! Merry Christmas, everybody! After finding out the news that she has a brain tumor, Dolly, like, kind of threatens her. Like, listen, if you don't change, you're gonna die. Uh, so I, gu I guess Dolly has the power over whether or not Regina has a brain tumor, which is pretty fucked up. Oh, that woman is so annoying. What woman? Because of this, she starts hallucinating Dolly Parton, who is no longer a homeless person, but get this, an angel. 
She, she's an angel now. You need some light. That's right. She's an angel now and she's just floating around her house which is pretty sick. So after finding out that she may have a brain tumor and hallucinating Dolly Parton in her rearview mirror, on top of this crazy old lady wanting to gouge her eyeballs out, she hits a local bar for a little drink, a little swig, a little Christmas chug -a lug with the lads. A little girl appears at the bar and serves her, as her dad is at the town meeting. You know that town meeting that she just came from, where everybody was singing about how much they hate her? You know, I'm surprised Regina doesn't ask her for her alcohol license, and then get her a nice hefty $2,000 fine for Christmas. You know, on top of trying to evict her and her family. The little girl doesn't realize that Regina is the wickedest witch of the middle, and so she decides to take this Christmas movie in an even cheerier turn, and explain about how her mother died when she when she was a child. Oh my god. I mean, when the girl was younger, not not when the mum was a child, because then that, that would have been weird. That would have really strange. Regina finally feels some sort of sympathy in this film, as her mother also died when she was young. However, the little girl explains the really believable reason of how her mother died. The little girl was literally only a few months old and she had a fever, but her mother couldn't get the meds from the local pharmacy because their rent had been made too high and they had to close. So Regina's dad wasn't the nice guy everyone thought he was after all? Honestly, I, I don't really understand. Like, they paint it out as if it's Regina's fault that the rent was put up, but she only inherited the town like six months ago, so, so I don't really understand who put the rent up. Because there's one scene when Regina's a kid, and she's like, yeah, let's keep the rent low, and he's like, okay, we will do. So the girl's mum had to drive to another town to get meds, but dies in a crash due to the storm, and then the little girl blames herself for getting a fever as a tiny baby, which is absolutely wild. I don't even blame the wickedest witch. If I hadn't gotten a fever, my mom would still be alive. And then Regina gets pretty upset about it and tells her it's not her fault, as she realizes it was probably actually her fault for the rent being too high. Which again, wasn't actually anything to do with her, as far as I'm aware. I'm rather confused. If we keep the rent slow and the spirits high, right daddy? <laughs> <laughs> It was obviously her dad who put the rent up, but everybody loved him. Like, surely if he was putting the rent up too high, they'd be like, yeah, oh, frick that guy, he's the wickedest, the wizard of the, of the middle. But they weren't. They were all simping for him. Maybe I just missed a line in this movie's 18 songs where she sings something like, I set the rent super high, fuck you guys. She then leaves all emotional because her dad turns up like, yo, it's the wickedest witch in the middle. The next morning she's woken up on the sofa because she got absolutely hammered, and then her assistant wakes her up, you know, the one I haven't told you about because her storyline is so pointless. If you want some backstory, at the start of the film when she's handing out the eviction notices, her assistant's going, sorry, I'm really sorry. That's pretty much all she's done so far in this film. But as it turns out, that might be what you get. Her assistant is actually a guardian angel in training. And if you haven't worked it out yet, Dolly's an angel who's trying to change Regina for Christmas. But for some reason, there has to be this unnecessary human who is acting as an angel whilst Dolly shows her how to be one. It really gives me the vibes of somebody who's writing an essay that needs to be 2,500 words long, but they've only got 2,300 words, so they have to write this extra storyline that just doesn't really have any place in it. This results in a weird scene where Dolly makes her dance as well. Like, I guess that's part of the training. But Dolly needs her assistant to try and help her change, even though Dolly speaks to Regina throughout almost the entire movie anyway, so that bit confused me. Maybe Regina was like, I ain't listening to no brain tumor hallucination. Get out of my, get out of my cup holder. <laughs> so imagine her getting a Starbucks and just squishing tiny Dolly with it. As the movie progresses, Regina starts feeling a little bit less like the Grinch who stole Christmas, the more that she is in her hometown. And we finally discover through a flashback why she broke Carl's heart and why she didn't like her father. Oh yeah, she, she doesn't like her dad either. The whole town likes her dad, but she doesn't like her dad, so there you go. It turns out that Carl was gonna give Regina a ring at a high school dance, but then Regina caught Carl and his female friend hugging after he showed her the ring that he had bought for Regina, and she freaks out. Instead of just confronting him about the situation, she hooks up with another guy instead, gets pregnant, and then her dad makes her leave town because he's ashamed of her and doesn't let Carl see her. I know that's an awful situation for her. This isn't real, by the way. This is a film. But, like, holy shit. Wouldn't you just confront him about it? She even says, I could never look Carl in the eye again. What? 
How? Honestly, if you're ever in a relationship where someone reacts like this to a misunderstanding, just fucking leave their ass. That's some toxic shit, man. Her dad, you know, the lovely guy that everybody loves, won't let her keep the baby, so she has to put it up for adoption. More on that later. Wow, what a festive musical full of joy this is, huh? She goes to the hospital for a little checkup on her noggin, and while she's there, this cheery Christmas film takes an even darker turn. Again, the little girl from the bar has now been in a car accident. <laughs> what happened to this cheery happy Christmas film? Dolly, we have suffered enough through 2020. Surely we don't need to suffer anymore. They're not sure the little girl is going to survive, so Regina actually shows some compassion for once, because I guess she sees the kid like the daughter that she never got to keep or something. She calls in the best neurosurgeon, no matter how much it costs, by helicopter or jet. You know what? I'm going to spoil it. I have to spoil this bit, because after the whole town is torn up about this, and the dad sings a really sad song about how if his daughter dies, at least she'll be reunited with her mum in heaven. <coughs> it's not the best neurosurgeon being flown in by Jet that saves the girl, which we never actually see by the way. Of course, it's guardian angel, Dolly Parton. She just like zaps, she just zaps her death away. Oh, and remember this couple from earlier who couldn't have a kid? Well, I guess Dolly just impregnates her with a little flick of the finger. Like, what? The Merry Christmas, I guess. So Regina's super emotional now, I guess. The guardian angel in training ignores tiny cup holder Dolly's orders and takes her to see Carl at his random junk shop. Dolly Parton's in the cup holder like, mm-mm, don't do that. And human-sized angel's like, mm, I'm, I'm probably gonna do that. He's obviously pissed about her making them all leave still, and she takes this prototype lamp thing that her dad invented for the square that she has a flashback about. In the flashback, she remembers him putting like a tiny Bible inside of it, because remember, the whole town are horny for God. The Bible's still in there, and inside she finds out about her dad giving her baby up for adoption, and she finds out who it is. Oh my god, you're not gonna believe this. What, what a huge twist this is. You're not gonna believe this. It's the pastor who couldn't have a baby. Who is now having a baby because Dolly impregnated his wife with, with a finger, by the way. And it's written in a Bible, so... It must be true. Meanwhile, despite literally having to leave the town that night, the whole town are in the church having a fucking right old hoot of a time. Once the pastor turns up to give the Christmas Eve sermon, he explains the story of his biological mother, and how he found out it was Regina Fuller. You know, the wickedest witch in the middle that they were all singing about a couple days before. And then she's like, psych, I ain't selling the town anymore. And nobody actually cares about the fact that she made them pack up all their shit on Christmas Eve. Like, you know, their entire lives and homes and businesses all packed up, ready to leave. Yeah, they forget all that and celebrate. Cause I guess she finally got a bit of Christmas cheer in her. Obviously it ends on a big song and dance. We find out that the angel in training is now a real angel and everyone lives happily ever after. Oh yeah, and, and the brain tumor wasn't real. Those first results must have come from a faulty machine or either that or it's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> literally just a mistake in the scans and apparently it was a quote-unquote Christmas miracle. Hey, maybe Dolly just zapped the brain tumor away. <laughs> oh shit, maybe she's zapping COVID away too. This really is a Christmas miracle. If it wasn't for Christine Baranski, I feel like this movie would have been missing a lot. She carried this movie more than Dolly Parton, whose movie it was. Let's be honest, she's not exactly got the voice of an angel these days ironically. Christmas is a time for sharing, knowing you've been blessed. But she wrote all the music for this movie, and the songs were alright. Especially the one where she said Rearview Mirror about 12 times. I like that one. The Wickedest Witch in the Middle song honestly got a good hoot out of me, thinking back to all the awkward pauses when the characters are just kind of nodding their heads like, mm-hmm. Yep, mm, just waiting for the bar of music to end. That song actually gave me a live musical vibe too, so uh, well done, Dolly. I guess you saved Christmas after all. Honestly, this movie wasn't awful, but I was hoping for a little bit more from Dolly. Let's be honest, it wasn't quite the light-hearted, cheery Christmas movie that I wanted to get me in the festive mood this year, but it was kind of well made. Even if it was kind of confusing at points, you know, with the pregnancy and high school boyfriend, and the kid his mum died, and the brain tumour, and how the, the hairdresser used to be the mayor, and the angel in training. Oh, and the entire town being evicted. Oh, and how Regina had a kid when she was a teenager. Oh, and how that kid was actually the, the guy who couldn't have a kid, and how Dolly Parton was an angel who'd show up every now and then and like kind of zapped her pregnant, and then somehow like zapped this kid who was in a car crash uh, back to full hell. It... I think I think I need to lie down. 
I'm gonna go. I'm 